everyone, you're allowed to ask questions uh, during just, you know, just let me know beforehand. Don't just start mid-sentence. That would be really cool. Uh, the Twitch stream for restreaming, if it ever becomes uh, necessary, you can find it in the pinned messages of the classroom chat. You can also ask questions in text form. Uh, usually, I would see them pretty quickly. So let's get going, everyone. Suv is here, too. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So in the first part of this lesson today, I want to talk about what you can do to make... Can we do something? Thank you. Um, I want to do something about the way that Clip greets you. Because if you see my interface now, hopefully it's moving if, if Discord allows it. Um, you can tell that I've basically undocked all of my interface. Why would I do this? Um, if you've come to the talk or to another class, you've heard people talk about flow state. What is flow state? Flow state is the minimum amount of resistance and like distance, I would say, between you and what you're working on, what you're drawing right now. What this means is you want to be somewhere where you don't really register your software, you don't register uh, your tablet or your screen, your display screen. It's basically just you and your artwork because in that state, usually you find it most, uh, well, least difficult to produce the things that you want to produce. You get a very good rhythm most of the time if, if life is gracious um, and generous. So usually we want to get somewhere close to it. Some people don't really, you know, develop the, the workspace, the mind space to dip into this whole flow state, flow state thing. And that's not a problem because um, oh, we can get close to it. Um, Lefty. Thank you. So what do we want to do for what? an optimal workspace? <laughs> Thank you. What do we want to do to achieve an optimal workspace for what we need from our software? Because again, your software is not supposed to be something that is a hurdle that you have to get over um, to get into a good mind space for work. It's supposed to be something that aids you in your transition to um, a very intuitive workflow. I have undocked all of my tools because you can probably tell from the screen that you're seeing right now that I have a very wide monitor. Why do I have that? It's because if I do, let's go back, all right? We want to do this together now. You want to reset to default. Look at this. Let's go back. Do you see how much less space it feels like? Even though it's the same amount of space, uh, the only real difference is that we have this part on here. Um, but it feels much, much less. Why is that? It's because we have limited it on the bottom. We have more limit on the left and on the right than before. We don't have the feeling of basically having a large black area with things that we have put there, almost like a desk, you know? Because in real life, you have, you have your space and you can scatter all of your important items around it. You can move them at any time when it's in the way of your movement, when it's in the way of your, you know, your elbow space, because we don't really want to be working out of our wrist. Small reminder. Um, so what we want to do is we want to take this blank canvas of a working environment and we want to customize this to our needs. If you personally don't care for an undark workspace, this is fine. Uh, you don't have to be worrying about this. Uh, perhaps this is going to be something worth knowing about just for the future. But for now, we want to make this floaty. We want to make this spacious. Mm. Stream is full. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you should, um, you should look up for Yami's stream. She's restreaming it. Thank you, Yami, again. <laughs> Thank you, Lefty. All right, let's go back to this. So when you first open this up and you don't have experience with digital software, perhaps you don't have experience with Clip specifically and you're looking for uh, your user interface settings in a way that you would perhaps in a 3D software. So you would feel like, okay, I want to go to file preferences. You will not be finding them here. Um, you will be finding things like you can turn your interface white, you can turn it dark. This is the light interface. Usually people don't want to do this because I know you guys and I know myself and I know my peers and uh, I have to say digital artists are kind of, you know, creatures of the shadows. So usually you want to go dark. Um, you can adjust the lighting situation that you have going on. You can adjust your 
use interface buttons, but. So can I just say something real quick about why you want to use dark mode? Sure. Uh, for, um, it, it will um, cause less eye strain yes. over time. And, uh, and it also uses less power on your display. Very true, right? Because it doesn't have to power up as much. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have the, to yeah, shine out more light. To get as hot. It, yeah. it'll, it'll increase your monitor's lifespan over time very slightly. I mean, that, <laughs> make, but honestly, though, like it, it's kind of aesthetic. Like uh, there are times when you sh should probably use. It. It's a preference. Uh, yeah, you you're right. If you feel more comfortable working in with like white non-dark mode menus, then do that. Just do whatever feels good. Or yeah. Personally, I can say that I had a phase where I used light mode to force myself to work less during the night because I was realizing I had a very nocturnal, um, I had a very nocturnal sleep pattern going on. I didn't. I wanted to like counteract that. So what I did was uh, I would turn off my my anti eye strain. You know the monitor settings that you get with Windows that make it more orange toned during the night to you know limit eye strain. To force myself to go to bed, I would work in light mode to, you know, go hard, but right. I don't recommend that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Either way, we want to go back to this. So we have a dark interface, but we don't know what to do with it. Because um, in other ways, some software does this. Instead of having like a preference menu, like with, you know, for example, Maya, uh, you would have timeline and then you were like, okay, uh, I want to kill the timeline. I want to get rid of this. You would be like looking for the X, but you will not find it. And if you right click on this, you will find that I'm right clicking right now. You cannot collapse it in that way either. So what you want to do is for every panel that we see that we want to hide, you have to look for this little button. It's like a little menu toggle. You want to go hide timeline palette. So instantly you can see this clears up our working space a lot. It isn't like it easily could be doable, you know, just working with this would already be much, much more pleasing to me, but we can go much better. We can go much higher. Now, so, <clears throat> I think it would be good to teach. Uh, how do you get that back? Oh, yeah, sure. Please. Thank you. Uh, to get any of these back. Don't worry about it. Uh, we're going to be killing some of these on purpose to bring them back later. But what you want to do is you want to go to Windows. For the timeline, for example, you could also want your animation cells. This is, of course, for you know our animating friends. This would be our animation cell window. You can also get rid of it like this, but you can't pull out most of them. Um, so it's back. Yay! You can also move these around, by the way. Uh, this is not something I will be explaining much because it's, in my opinion, quite self-explanatory. But you can move any of your sub-tools into these boxes with your other subtools. What does a subtool mean? What does a tool mean? <clears throat> your tools are something like um, move, you know? Let's generally, let's generalize here. Your tools are something like, uh, these are your movement tools. These are your uh, user experience tools, you know, zooming, moving, these kinds of things. But once you get to the brushes, uh, it becomes less defined. So you have things like your pens, but you have a G pen, you have another G pen, you have all these kinds of things. These are your tools and your sub tools. Your pen, if we want to take this out, this is what is one of the most essential windows that you will want to keep. Because, of course, these are the slots in which you can collect your custom brushes. These are the slots in which you can make your own. We will not be talking about how to make your own brushes, by the way. That's a whole <laughs> that's a whole other topic, but if you're interested in it, we can probably set something up in the future. Either way. So we are this far at this point. Uh, you'll notice you probably don't know what these do. You probably don't know why you would want them. Uh, let's touch on the hotbar real quick. What this is, is a customizable bar in which you can put anything you like. This does not have to be something like, I don't know, in, in 3D software, you would have something like export as. We can have that. That's this button. It says JPEG. And if I want to save this image here, it would immediately tell me to, you know, go to my standard destination, export as JPEG single layer, 
Um, this window comes up, uh, JPEG settings. We won't be talking about export settings either, but you guys can probably <laughs> get that on your own either way. So you have the exports, you have your undo, you have your redo, pretty standard, save, open file, and the Clip Studio uh, overlay, which lets us later move to the asset store where we can get custom assets. But again, another topic. I, um, I want to recommend going in there on your own time, checking out the tools and material uh, packages that are offered for free. A very good idea to explore very useful tools is usually to go for the popular monthly or all time because they allow you to see the most downloaded brushes, materials, 3D objects, which Clip has quite a lot of them because they allow user submissions. Um, apart from these, these are very standard. You can then put any custom command in here. What does this mean? If we go into the bar and we right click, you can see command bar settings. If you hit this, you will find a very, very confusing menu. Um, if you, get a, if you give it a look, you will find that you can easily expand all of these. And after a second, you should come to realize it's an exact mirror of your bar up here. What does this mean for us? Are you someone who likes to play with color? You probably want to go and open this, edit, tonal correction, level correction, or Let's choose something else. Gradient map. A very, very good at working is also gradient map. Uh, we might touch on that later. If someone has any questions, absolutely OK. Ask away. Anyway, gradient map. How do we get this up here? You pull it. <laughs> a bit strange, perhaps, but um, you have to drag and drop this into your hotbar up here. And it's going to stay there. You can put several if for some reason you want to have different subtool settings. Um, I know there's a way to do that if I remember correctly, but right now I can't tell off the top of my head. So let's not touch on that. Either way, anything you want, you can put there. This doesn't have to be something like that. This could also be something like um, window, canvas, new window. What does that do? When you do, a large scale painting. Perhaps you started with like a value thumbnail and now you're putting in like a castle and there's like a foreground with like a knight on a horse. And you're you're currently rendering out the armor on the horse. What can happen is you lose sight of your general values. So while you're rendering away on the horse, you're making it a lot of visual noise. There's a lot of value difference in the horse armor. Uh, the face of the horse now has like beautiful red patches, even though it's like a black stallion or whatever. Um, so instead of having like this white horse with a dark knight on top of it, you now have like a gray, black, white mess with a gray, black, white mess on top of it. And once you zoom out and you regain the vision of your whole composition, you will find that it's not good anymore and you will not know why. Because you drew a horse, you drew horse armor, the night looks really good. Um, so where did you go wrong? What happened is you had you have lost yourself in the details. Uh, a general rule of thumb is to you would rather work zoomed out than zoomed in. I know we've heard this before because it happened on uh, on Ethan's channel, if I remember correctly. So how can we combat that? If we're like a person that really likes to, you know, the armor has to be popping. We want to not look at the big, I don't know, landscape with a castle while we're trying to concentrate on this horse. What you can do is, with the new castle, uh, new, <laughs> new castle command, with the new window command, what we can do is we can get this extra window on top of our workspace. And much like software like PureRev, what this does is it's going to stay on top. So once we go back in here and we're like, oh my god, I really want my character to have heterochromia. I have like a little, little, little blue and green eye situation. We can do that. And on the right side, in a window that, by the way, could even just be as small as this, because if you do value painting, it's a good idea to have it be the size of a thumbnail. 
you know, like a little sketch situation. Mm. All right, I'm looking at chat. Is there any way you can move the hotbar somewhere else or hide it? Um, <clears throat> I actually never tried to get rid of it. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we can't start trying now. Mm. I might have to come back to that later. So it would be really cool if we could hold on to the question. Um, but pretty sure moving it somewhere else is perhaps more likely than to hide it. <laughs> this stream might convince me to get a clip studio paint. Good. All right. Uh, yes, yummy. Very good. Um, I want to also bring attention to that. Clip studio is right now on sale. By the way, I don't get paid by them. I wish it was that way, but. <laughs> No, no, which will think non sponsored classroom. Non sponsored uh, classroom. How much is it on sale for right now, by the way? I got it when it was like $80. It's 50% the BX, off. The BX so version. I think it's like 25 at the moment. Yeah. Uh, if you don't get the, like the uh, XP or PX, whichever yes. one the more expensive one is. Yeah. I mean, the, um, the, the regular one is essentially full feature. The EX one is, is, is if you're an animator, you definitely want to get that. Yeah. So apparently it's 25 for the pro. Um, if you look at chat, you will see the offer. Uh, should how, be how, much is, how much is the EX version right now? Mm, 25 for pro, so. Mm. Oh, well, you can probably look and um, try and get your hand of, hands on that. As Space Dad said, if you're interested in getting like into animation, you probably want to go for the EX, just because of the extra features. Uh, other than that, if you do like comics and zines, you probably also want the EX because I know for a fact that uh, with the EX one, you can compile a zine with a specific preview uh, software function that I don't think Pro includes. I'm trying to actually find and learn like how um, Japanese animators use, use Clip Studio EX in their workflow. I found like actually some videos that describe it, but they are in Japanese with auto-translated subtitles. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna have to ask around a bit. There's like a bunch of soccer guy animators in the West that use it. I'm gonna have to maybe get some uh, tips from on how to set things up. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Anyway, it's actually 109 for the X, which is a steal. So try and get that if you can. Other than that, you can always, as uh, Manon said, you can still upgrade later with the discount. Oh, so yeah. get it, get they're it. also a very very friendly customer service team, I have to say. Mm. So let's go. We have a hotbar. We have no more distractions in the bottom. But how do we actually get all of this on the sides that looks okay on my white screen, but doesn't look okay if you have a smaller monitor? Perhaps you can't afford another one, which is, you know, usually the situation. <laughs> um, so how do we get rid of all this? Because I do feel kind of caged in, you know, it's kind of, it's getting cramped in here. So what we want to do is actually, Let's start with this. What this is, is Clip saw an opportunity to not use like a mod extra software or extra window, but instead have all of their materials right there in your face at all times. This is a convenience question, but if you don't use it, this is not for you and you don't want this here. But if you collapse it, it stays here. Even if you collapse it all the way, it's going to be this little line, but this little line can make a difference because it's space that you are not using effectively. Again, if you have a smaller monitor, this amount of space can really ruin your day. Working on a laptop and this thing is here on the side with the same size as it is on my ultra wide screen, not fun. We don't want that. So if you don't use these, again, you can bring them back under Windows, Material, it's these here. So what we have to do now to get rid of them, hide them. Hide all of them. Again, if we want to use them, we can just bring them back using the Windows command. This is where all the comic, if, like the comic materials are, all of your specific brushes, all of your 3D material. If you have the EX version, this is where all of your houses are. You know, all the special stuff. But in normal day-to-day -day painting, me personally, I would rather have to spend two extra clicks to bring it back than to live every day with these windows open, taking up space that I would rather have clean and empty. Because really, as clean your, your, your 
head can only be as focused as your workspace is at the time. I know some people thrive in chaos. This could be you. And if it is, that's fine. But for everyone else, we want to make sure that even just this little line is not space we want to waste. Mm. Did you know in Clip Studio you can press Tab key to collapse all windows? Yes, you can. It's very useful, but if you are, as me, left-handed, the Tab key is just not worth pressing. <laughs> um, of course, you can remap this to another button. I have a 3D modeling mouse that I got for cheap, which has a lot of uh, customizable keys on the side. I used to have that kind of command on one of these, but on the long, long run, I find that just cleaning it up once and having everything accessible with just a click of my pen um, at all times is, for me, much more intuitive. But again, to do this, it's tab. Someone put it in the chat, so um, you can take note. Mm. Someone asked, when you click Clip Studio, is it a one-time payment or the software is like a subscription where you have to pay monthly? I want to touch on that um, because, you know, we have iPad users here. I am one as well. Mm. When you get it on the PC, you get several licenses. So you can install the software on your PC, on your laptop, maybe on your... I don't know, some of some friends, well, that's illegal, but perhaps if you had a friend you and they really like clip. Times you can install it on different yeah. Be very but, careful about it and back up your software. Yeah, because um, there's a limit to it and it's a hard limit, so don't worry about it, but you should be mindful of it. Um, but what also happens is on iPad, right. yeah, on iPad, it's a subscription model. So there is, if I remember correctly, a three-month grace period where you can try it. But you will have to pay a subscription every month if you want to work exclusively on the iPad version of Clip. That sucks. Um, is it worth it? It's probably one of the most powerful softwares that the iPad has. Um, so that's definitely something to consider. Anyway, Clip, let's go back. Um, so we now have, this is gone. How pleasant. Uh, the navigator. Let's just go through all of these one by one. So timeline, we already put that away before. Auto action. My place <laughs> PlayStation. My Photoshop users probably know what this is, but auto actions can be very very powerful tool. Um, but if you don't know how to use them, they are a waste. Uh, if you don't use them regularly, there's no need to keep the window here. So we're gonna get rid of it for now. But if you are someone who has a very, very methodical workflow. If you do the things the same way every time, if you, every time that you finish your artwork, you're one of the people who like to put a 10% grain, then turn up the contrast by exactly five points, then you want to put a blur on it again. Maybe you want to do some chromatic aberration. So you duplicate and then you like do offset, move it three pixels to the side, make it completely blue, and then do the same with red on the other. This is your holy grail because you will not have to do these things yourself anymore. What you can do, almost the same as with Photoshop, is that you can program, basically, it sounds more complicated than it is. Um, you can record a specific set of actions. And then once that's done and it's programmed, you can just press play and it's going to do it for you. This extends to things such as saving uh, in a specific manner or closing and then reopening something. This is your magic tool. <laughs> but for someone as me, I like to be more all over the place with my finishing touches. So for me, it's a show time. Uh, it's a show hide, hide timeline. And then no, oh, okay, I know what happened now, but we want to do height auto action palette. Anyway, history. This is a hot take, but some people swear we're having a small history or by limiting the history because um, you can also customize the amount of safe, uh, well, safe steps. I want to say, you know, the amount of times that you can go back. You can customize that to save uh, 
performance. I can afford to have a large history. Um, thank God, because I do like to use it religiously, which is the same reason as for why I want to move my history to the center of my screen. Because right now, me personally, personally, I'm working with a small tablet, small as in like A5 size. What this means for me is that I have to be conservative with the amount of large strokes that I do, sad. And I have to have my my windows within reach so that I can quickly, you know, be like tap, 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 okay? There's not a lot of distance traveled between um, between what I do and what I do here. Why is this important? It's because if I have to, every time I want to redo something, and I don't have control Z, I don't use this uh, for a very simple reason. <laughs> I'm left-handed and I don't want to remap it uh, easy as that. So I use the history panel. Mm. And the least amount of distance I want to travel between my actual drawing where I'm working and this window, the better, because it's not going to take me out of the flow. Mm. Okay, let me look at chat. Does anyone have a question so far? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I have one. Sure, go for it. Um, is the history panel needed if you are uh, if you can use Control Z? Ah, uh, okay. Well, I think it depends because usually, when you think about it, your answer would be no, right? Because um, you're like, well, I can just use Control Z. But depending on the size of your history, depending on the amount of steps that you're saving uh, and the way that you work, perhaps you would like to keep the option open for yourself to just be like, okay, so I've been working on this painting for oh, I don't know how long. And um, I don't do too many chicken scratch lines. I usually do like large shapes at once before I lift my pen. Um, so my history, even if it's just like 50 or 100 steps, it's going to, you know, go far pretty back, go back pretty far, my bad, um, speaking in terms of just pure amount of change. So the difference between using the window in that situation in your finger is, uh, or like the control Z command is, is that you can just go all the way up and reality check yourself. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you can use this to reorient yourself and um, be like, hmm, okay, so maybe I'm back to the painting with the castle and the horse. Mm. And you did all that rendering, right? And maybe you're at the, at the point where right now you're thinking, this horse armor is looking so cool. This knight is looking so cool. Um, I'm not really thinking about my values right now because I just think it's really cool and maybe it's worth it, right? And then you zoom out and you're like, this is really epic. I actually really like this because your eye is like, yeah, and your brain is like, oh shit, dude, this is fire. We worked so hard. And maybe having the history panel uh, is helpful just for one single reason, which is um, maybe you want to zoom out and be like, but is it actually fire? You know? Maybe you want to be like, is that just me hoping that it's good or is it actually good? Especially in a situation where when you do like large illustrations or like concept paintings or whatever, or just any type of render, um, you usually want to do several passes. What a pass is, is uh, you finish a painting once and when you think it's done then you get feedback and you do another painting on top of it. You basically just paint over all the little areas where you're like, I could push this more, I could do this, I could do that. So you do a second pass. Sometimes you do a third, and then you do a fourth, and then you do a fifth. And um, usually in that type of environment, you have a way to check your passes at all times. So you can just you know disable all your layers and be like, okay, sure. So this is actually getting better, because that's what you want to make sure. Um, but you could also do that with the history tool. And that's usually what I keep my history size this large for, because I do need that. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I hope that helped. Other than that, of course, you can just control Z all the time. I mean, why keep it around if you don't do that kind of stuff? Mm. 
autumn added to that question. I feel like if you're doing painting, painting or something, the history would be a lot better. But for simple line and color, you can just control Z. Right. Yeah. Oh, I got paint all over me. <laughs> oh, well. Um, yeah. Does the history tab go all the way back to the first action or still limit? Uh, as Coder said, she's right. You can actually go into your settings and then set it. Uh, please be mindful of that because, um, as Autumn said, this is going to be very taxing on your computer. This is going to be potentially the reason why when you open something, well, not when you open because your history resets at that time, but uh, when you have your software like minimized or something and you realize, why is my computer chugging? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Or perhaps you go into your software and you're like, okay, I do want to do that you know, reality check moment. I want to go and uh, go all the way back and look all of that deep in the eye and see what happened between. Uh, what's going to happen is your PC might be like, so I actually know what's here, but there's so much information stored uh, that I need a hot minute before I can actually show you, you know? Mm. So the, I uh, just want to make a note about so that is why um, digital artists should be aiming for about 32 to 64 gigabytes of RAM. Yeah. Um, for their uh, for uh, for systems they build, uh, you want to make it uh, as smooth as possible uh, for when you're drawing. And uh, the undo, uh, the amount of times you can undo often eats up quite a bit of RAM. Mm. So set it really high, and you're going to want to set it really high. Yeah, dedicated wham. You're right. <laughs> okay, so let's go back in here. So we cleaned up all this area, so we want to probably take that a bit higher because even if you don't work with many layers, which is of course um, a question of style and workflow. Some people like to have everything very neatly separated. Some people like to, you know, merge quite often and use that in a different way. You always want to have a pleasant amount of space here. There's absolutely no situation in which you would want this because nothing that can be here in most situations is worth taking up all this space. You want to have your layers, quick access. You don't want to be like, ah, where's my layers? Oh, right, it's all the way down here. Um, so let's bring this up a little. Layer property. Um, you will find that the amount of use you find for this depends very, very largely on the things that you do digitally. Are you a comic artist? Do you letter and clip? Um, mm -hmm. All right. Are you a comic artist? Do you want to do lettering? Then you probably want this around because what this does is, all right. It allows you access to these kinds of things. You see it? Very, very simple if you want to do like some kind of text or comic based things in clip. You probably want this. This is also where you can do the automatic screen toning settings. Very useful if you know how to use them. Uh, the automatic screen toning, just a very quick note. It, uh, basically, what it does um, is that based on the amount of DPI, the dots per inch, it generates uh, a screen tone pattern based on the darkness of the pixels in a specific area. So you can clearly tell that. Wait, let's go here. You can clearly tell the difference. And if I turn this off, you see why? You know? Mm, anyway. So that's what the layer property settings are for. We don't really need them. Uh, so let's kill them. Bye. Search layer. Uh, this is relevant to your workflow if you have a lot of layers. Me, I like to merge and work on free layers max at all times. So this has to go. Navigator. Um, navigator can be like your replacement for the thing I told you about with the little small extra window. Some people like to use the navigator instead. Personally, I don't, but 
I like to keep the navigator run because it leaves it allows me access to this tool. It's a quick flip. Um, I know it hurts you guys, but you should you should flip your work. <laughs> uh, please go through the pain, become better, fight the power. So we want the navigator run. Do we want the sub view? Uh, I am not an expert on what the sub view tool does. Ooh, Item bank. Please go for it. Tell us. It sub view is mm -hmm. a great way to have your references right on. Oh. The and what you do is you have you make sure the sub view is there, and, and on the bottom it should show a little file. And that's where you can import images. Really? That's actually kind of cool. I just learned this today, and it, I, really, I like it a lot. <laughs> So personally, I would probably recommend you to use something like PureRef instead because you can save separate boards. Um, but if that's not something that you can do or you just don't feel comfortable with that in your workflow, I of course understand. But PureRef for anyone here, very, very worth looking into. Great software. You can get it for free if you like. Is there a hotkey for flipping? Uh, I'm not a hotkey person, but I think you can set one either way. So whether or not there's one right now, you can probably go to uh, modify key settings. And then you can usually set all kinds of things here. So the reason I'm showing you this instead of just telling you the one that's probably already there <laughs> is because you want to customize. Because there's no need to keep hotkeys for a specific reason that I'm going to tell you about once we're done rearranging all of this. because. Clip is nice. You don't have to do it every time you install it because why do that? <laughs> Did they think and then they helped us. So uh, the right side of our screen is looking much better now. Uh, I have an idea of what's going on. I don't feel intimidated. I can put everything I want. So for other people who have a, like very good visual memory, you probably remember that something used to be between them. So let's look at that. Mm. No. Oh, here. Never mind. I found it. So you want your color wheel popped out. Why is that? Um, you also want it to be a triangle, but that's for later. Um, why do you want your color wheel popped out? You yeah. want to be in charge of your colors at all times. At all times. If it's in the corner of your screen, um, perhaps this is just me, but I become tempted to forget about what I'm doing colors-wise. What you want to be doing colors-wise is you want to be aware. You want to be in control. You want to be the one making the decisions. So when I'm working on this, right, and I'm like, shooby shooby, right? I'm doing my thing, and I'm just randomly picking things. I want to be picking things. I don't want to just be like, okay, it's all the way down here. Uh, it's kind of cramped. You know, I'm not seeing much. So I think this should be kind of red. All right. I think you want like maybe a little, you know, just shift it a little. Um, you are being oppressed. <laughs> You're being oppressed by the spacing in your user interface. You are not the one making the decisions right now. We want this large because there's a lot of colors. I don't know if you know this, but there's a whole lot of them and you should be using all of them and they should all be in your repertoire. So as large as it can be without disturbing your space, put this right smack dab in the middle so that you remember you have all of this at your disposal and you should be using all of it at all times. Um, we will be talking more about colors later when we actually get to the, to the demo that we want to do. <laughs> Is there any questions at this point? Oh. Is that mm -hmm. it? Is it V? Hmm? Sorry? Uh, I have uh, another question. Sure. Uh, which is better, the square or the triangle? Oh, yeah. I want to touch on that. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so when you choose colors, there's three 
variables that you want to be thinking about. There's your brightness, pretty self-explanatory. There's your saturation. This is zero, this is 100, right? So we know for sure now that, so this is very saturated and also very dark. This is somewhere between those two extremes. This is very saturated, but also very bright. We have a very pleasant color. And these are our grays. I want to touch on the grays later. Um, it's very, very clear. And then the third variable is our hue. That's our ring. You know? Uh, so we have this axis. You know, it's kind of like in 3D where we have X, Y, and Z. This is one of them. This is the second. And this is the third. If we look at this, it doesn't communicate the same concept with the same amount of clarity, you know? You get lost in this, which is, you know, one could argue this is the black that's based on color. This is the black that is desaturated. As a digital artist, you don't care. <laughs> and I tell this as someone who's made plenty of books. I have published several art books myself. I know about the difference between one or the other. And I will tell you now, when you print, this is going to be the least of your concerns. You will not be thinking about what your blacks are because you can just compile all of your pages and then you go into Photoshop and then you tell Photoshop, look at all of my pages, replace all of these blacks that are, that are neither one or the other and make them the 100, 100, 100, 100 black, which is what you will probably want to be printing if you care this much about blacks because it's a very deep one. Um, so we don't need this axis. There's absolutely no need. Um, this tells us, my bad, uh, this tells us much more clear, clearly the things that we should be caring about, which is again, this axis, this axis, and this one. Hope that helps. Is there anything else? You mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, controlling how much history you go back for. How do you change mm -hmm. that in settings? Uh, let me look real quick. Mm. Here, preferences, performance, undo. I have mine on two hundred. I think that's the default. Uh, I'm not sure. I might have pushed it up a little because I do a lot of painter work. Um, and I really do want to go and have that looking back uh, reality check moment. This is also where your virtual memory is stored. If you have several um, hard drives, you know, one of them is faster than the other. One of them has your Windows installed on it. Uh, you probably want to keep it very central so that it doesn't lag as quickly, especially if you have an older model. Mm. This is also where you can limit your uh, memory, if that's something that you need to do. Mm. Uh, All right, so anything one thing, else? One thing about the colors, we talked today about the color sets. You want to say it now? Yes. Thanks. Yes, let's move on. Um, so we took this out, and you'll find that hidden underneath is a whole bunch of other subsets. You see this? <laughs> um, most of these. I want to assume none of you will have a use for. Um, what's happening here? The color slider. Usually you will eventually want to be able to use color slider instead of wheel. Why is that? Uh, lots of reasons. I don't want to touch on them right now because this gets into like the color theory side of things. Um, that's going to take a lot of time. I don't feel confident uh, doing that as well. But color slider, very worth looking into. Uh, you don't have to right now if you don't feel that you want to be doing that right now. So let's hide it for now. Color set. This is what is usually right underneath my navigator at all times. Why is that? <clears throat> when you do thumbnail work, when you want to do value sketches, these are those like little black and white ones where it's like, ah, oh, black foreground gray midground and then in the background there's this castle or whatever um those are to understand 
foreground, background, whatever, but they're also value studies. And getting a feeling for value is one of the most important parts of your learning process right now. It doesn't matter the level you're at. They can instantly help you make much more compelling pieces, no matter if that's like a Pinterest girl face with hair and glasses or a landscape painting with an epic tower in the background. It doesn't matter. You need values. Um, and with the color set, listen closely now. This one was a, was a goddamn lifesaver for me. <laughs> but what you can do is you can go here. Okay, standard color set, all right. And you can go here, how to show. Are you following? How to show list medium. Or actually, let's do list small so we can see more. Do you see that? Do you see this? How crazy is that? This is the most valuable thing you've seen in your life as a digital artist who's trying to learn values. Because what you have here is a perfect list of grays between 5 and 95%, transparency, black and white. Imagine the power you have in your hand when you just, you, you, you wake up in the morning, you're like, all right, I want to become a better artist. I want to learn something about values today. I want to do some value sketches. And instead of being like, I'm going to show you this, this move brain version, right? So we have, we, we pick up our pen. Uh, we want to do. Ah, here we go. We want to do. Oh, okay, so I kind of, I want to do, oh, yeah, maybe there's like, uh, maybe there's like a dude, and he's like, he's got a big sword, and he's, he do be standing, you know, and he's, oh, boy. I'm already lost without my setup. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's do this. And then you're like, so this is my mid-tone. Um, this is my mid-tone now. And then you're like, so then bright. I think this is good enough. I don't want to use pure white because my teacher told me that's a bad idea. Uh, so we have white. And then our dark is probably something like this. You know, just furthest away from the camera, or it could be used in the foreground as well. This is good, right? I have three compelling colors. Um, and now for the next one, I'll just color pick him because I have a mid ground color our medium gray, and I have the front gray and the back gray. What if I told you, if you do this for several weeks and you pick colors differently every day, and then in the end, you're like, so now I actually want to use this and apply to a job. You will find that it looks like shit because every single one that you pick out of your sea of value paintings that you did, Everyone that looks different from the other because you chose different values, you now have to go in and fix them all <laughs> so they look coherent. What if you just knew that there was a way to always pick gray 95 for your darks? There's always a way to pick gray 50 for your mid colors and gray 5% for your front colors. <laughs> You know, for me, this was a revelation because it got kind of annoying having to pick it from a PNG that I would have to load into my scene every day. So hopefully you guys feel the same. <laughs> I can't seem to get that list to show with the text. All right, um, let's look at that again. It's actually the color set window. It has a bunch of colorful little boxes over here. And you have to click on the toggle, the menu toggle. How to show. List small. I'm going to leave it open for a second and take a drink. 
I invite all of you to hydrate. Uh, sit up straight, stretch your neck, stretch your hands. Maybe save your file. Sorry, just to clarify for people that have the same version of um, it mm -hmm. as me, it's, it lists it under view in the same option drop down, not how to show for me. Just um, if anyone else is in the same position I'm in. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I've heard that before. Thank you. That's very, very kind to say. Yeah, apparently for some people it's view instead. Uh, I actually have an issue because when I go to the view, the view portion of it, it actually it doesn't it doesn't show that for mine. Okay, what does it say? Uh, it shows size X small, size small, step eight, list small, medium. Yeah, list small. Oh, okay. That's the one you want. Thank you. Where can I find exercises for the grays? I would love to do those. Uh, we can talk about that later in the end. I think I would like to finish the part um, where we do the deconstruction of the user interface. And then after that, we can probably talk about value exercises before we move on to the demo. But <clears throat> so list small. Let's go back here. <clears throat> so we have our history. We have our color wheel nice and big and chunky. Uh, by the way, you can have these windows overlap with the actual software windows. Uh, which I find is really nice, unless you need this slider a lot, then probably not. But uh, one of the few hotkeys that I actually use is to press spacebar to move around. So I invite you to do that. Mm. So this is all done. <laughs> Yay, we actually have some more space now, and it's looking much more cleaned out. And we actually know this is our color sets. We don't need it very often. That's why it's over here. Um, our navigator, so we can flip it all times. Oh, there is. But we still have more here. <laughs> Intermediate color uh, is something that I don't personally use. I know that some people like to, you know, dip their toes in this because it gets you very stable colors. You know, you always know which one you picked most likely, but I don't personally care for it. Uh, approximate color, I feel the same way about that. Color history. Um, for someone who paints, this could be like a golden tool because you could go back and be like, so, uh, so I had this really beautiful accent color. I don't remember what it was. I never used it at full opacity. I will never find this color again. Color history. You can, if this is not something that you keep. You know, maybe I was like, oh, this is the perfect yellow. But I'll never find it again because, oh no, I drew red over it. Who knows? But then you go back later and you're like, I kind of do want to bring that back. <clears throat> you can always go window, color history. It's going to be here. You don't have to have the window open for color history to work. So... That's something worth remembering. Brush size. These are presets brush sizes. Um, could be useful for you if you do like comic work and you always use the same sizes. Uh, you can probably you know program them in here. Uh, I personally don't have such long... How do I say? I don't do comics. <laughs> Not right now. So I don't have the need to have coherent line art that always has the same size. Bye-bye. So... We are left with this, and you will find that when I opened the software the first time, maybe you remember that I had a little box here. So that is not what I wanted. You have a little box here, and it had my colors right here, and my tools and little boxes over here. Does anyone have an idea what that could have been? Because when I first found out about this, I was shocked. <laughs> what could this have been? The magic floating box that had my colors and all of my tools. <laughs> Anybody? Beryl Titer is typing. Because when I first saw this, it was actually on this server. I saw someone had that. It was Petra. And um, she, she would later see that I had sent her several DMs like, 
what is that box? You're driving me insane. It's so practical. It's so small and compact. Um, I just cannot find it. I can't find the name of the tool. Uh, what it actually is, is it's your tools. Look at this. You know, this blew my mind. Uh, because growing up with, you know, things like Paint Tools I and Photoshop, I never considered pulling it out and looking at what would happen if I made it a box. And this here was a mind blown moment for me. <laughs> in Paint Tools I, you can pull out too. Yes, you probably can do that in most uh, other softwares, to be honest, but it never occurred to me to actually do it, you know? I, also, I just accepted that my tool bar is a bar. It's going to stay a bar. I will never, ever have anything else done. <laughs> and I learned, okay, okay. And Paint Tool Side, you can do it too. I just read. Uh, Horror Ho, thank you. Paint Tool Side 2 allows you to do that as well. Can watch stream is full. Um, Oblivion, you can watch the restream on Yami's Twitch. Thank you again, Yami. You are actually the best person ever. Um, so yeah, tool, here it is. We have a beautiful little box now. You can customize all of these. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but for now, what we have over here is our sub tool. This is probably the second or third most important part of our user interface because we can be like, okay, I want to, I want to have, uh, let's say, uh, I want to have the paint. I want to have my, my, my tools. This is where you actually pick which tool that is. So I really recommend having them grouped together. Something like this, perhaps. You know? So that way you can be like, so I want to do a selection. My go-to selection tool is the lasso. Uh, but maybe I want to do like a magic uh, preset thing where it can fill my selection at the same time, which I can find in the asset store, by the way. Um, you want them to be close together. Again, because what you want is you want the shortest amount of distance between what you're doing and where you need things to be changed while you're doing it. That is the one way to make your, to make like the distance between your software, the thing that you're doing, and you yourself doing it as short as possible and as intuitive as possible. And that's the goal. Mm. Because that's how you develop healthy art habits. <clears throat> I'm going to take a sip. <clears throat> so we have the tool properties here. Mm. Usually this, um, this, these are not many things uh you will find that oftentimes you won't even touch this box but i would not recommend getting rid of it ever why is that if you do dabble in perspective which you should <clears throat> let's make a new layer here make a new perspective ruler this is all fucked don't don't care too much about the way this is looking, right? Don't. But, um, come on. It should let me. Oh, come on. I should be able to select this now and. Wait a minute. I want to talk to you about something here. Uh, I might have fucked it up though, perhaps. Mm. because one of the most important perspective tools you can actually calibrate it through your tool property oh Cal is saying the twitch stream isn't working I'm only ever getting audio frozen video never both yummy can we do something about that or is that perhaps just your connection call I'm going to take a quick break and resolve this Coder is also offering um, 
advice on how to achieve any of these effects and in, in user interface things in, code, in Krita, uh, which is a great open source free art program for the people listening and watching who cannot afford clip right now. Twitch stream is working fine for BMP draws. Carl, do you think you could mic uh, mute your microphone? That would be really nice. We're getting yeah. some noises. Oh my gosh. I'm <laughs> I'm Don't worry about it. Thank you. That's very nice. Twitch stream working wonderfully for cute crop. Balachi, Arif. Mm. Okay, but they're in the Discord now. All right. Where's the perspective ruler thing? The perspective ruler is a blue tool. And then you can be like, all right, doing all kinds of things. I am not an expert on using clip for perspective things. I will say this very clearly. I have used Photoshop for things like that in the past. Clip has not been kind to me when it comes to perspective. <laughs> but that's fine. You don't need to be using the same software for everything. But uh, you probably want to know that if you want to get into this, um, holding shift will make your horizon line. Horizon. Well, no, horizontal. That's the word. <laughs> okay. I have a question about Clip Studio, says Oblivion. I saw that you can make a great line out inside. Is it possible in Clip? Because the line tool in Photoshop is not great to me. Um, I want to talk about this. But it has to be very, I'm going to give a very general answer. There is no inherently better or worse software for either thing, for either discipline. You cannot generally say, this software is better for painting, this software is better for line art, this software is this and that. The only thing that you can objectively say that has that kind of vibe to it, I want to say, is you can objectively say that Photoshop does not have a good blur tool. I mean, a good blending tool. You can objectively say that Sai and Clip have better blending tools because that is an algorithm. You can objectively say Clip has no liquify. That sucks. Um, or that this and that tool is very, very significant to some workflows and it's not achievable in this and that software. For example, uh, what's it called? Intelligent fill or the... Um, clone, patch, all of these. But for such a thing as line art, you cannot say whether or not to have, whether or not you can have better line art or better line work in this and that software because it's up to you to find a workflow to replicate the effect that helps you in the software that you're comparing it to. So... What you want to do is you want to find a brush that can replicate the brush that you like to use inside, if this is your example. Um, you want to find out what the stabiliz stabilization was on that brush, because usually when people talk about line art, they don't really mean the brush or the engine of the software. They talk about the stabilizers. Um, so it's all, that's just a whole lot of trial and error, and no one can help you with that most of the time. <clears throat> I would really recommend trying the standard clip uh, lining brushes, using them with not too much stabilizer because you don't want to become, uh, you don't want to use it as a crutch. You don't want to have those lines that look very, very, oh, I am the stabilizer person. I literally cannot do this out of my elbow. I need the tool to do it for me because what you want is you, to, you want to have line confidence. You want to develop line confidence over a long time. It takes a lot of time. It's a lot of work but it's very worth it, and people can tell the difference. <clears throat> uh, actually, I have a question over that. Sure. Um, how much stabilization do you think? Like, at what point is it too much stabilization? Um, if I see you using 13 or something, I might personally become offended. <laughs> but because you are, you are uh, starting to develop bad art habits, most likely. This depends on your workflow. For example, um, if you want to work in animation, there is a different level of stabilization that makes sense for you to use 
than if you want to work in, let's say, fucking concept art. Because if you're a concept artist and you do environmental paintings and you have like, you have like a brush that is uh, textured and it has angles um, and you, you're currently drawing like a nice mountain line, you know, you don't need stabilization because you want natural jitter in your line. You want to have the ability to do that at the time where you need it to be, you know, something in your repertoire. But if you want to do animation, you kind of need to be able to draw circles pretty fucking good. And if a stabilization tool is what helps you get there, that's fine. Do you want to try and develop the habits that let you draw these beautiful circles without such a high level of stabilization in the future? Probably, yeah. Um, is this something that you can use to get there? Probably, yes, as well. So this really depends on your, on your area. Someone like Spacetide can probably give you more information on... Uh, what that means in practice, because I don't personally work in the animation industry. I have never. I know that some high-profile animation industry people, when you look at their YouTube stuff, you can tell that they're working with a lot of stabilizer because they need this uh, security, you know? They need the security to be able to make those curves work for them. But I can't tell you much about that. I can tell you some videos. Apart from that, I'm not really the person that can probably help you there. But for a normal illustrating, sketching, fundamental workflow, I don't want you doing anything like 13, 20, you know? Yeah. So yeah. then I actually have another question. This is separate. Sure. Um, what if you have a workspace that you don't really get a lot of room to use your elbow? How do you suggest uh, combating that? Mm. I see a lot of people using an angled approach for this. So what they do is instead of sending, instead of sitting flush against your desk, you want to have a little space to the back and you want to turn your body a little and angle your drawing tablet to the edge of the table. Because this way, the elbow space is the space you were prior sitting in. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I get it. Yeah. This can work for you. You can also try and just get more general space between you and your tablet. So just kind of scoot back, just scoot. And then trying to use the el elbow space in the front and back uh, motion instead of going left and right. But this really depends on the space you're in and <laughs> your flexibility. Um, <clears throat> uh, another, I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Don't worry um, about it, just go for it. So the tablet I use, uh, it has like, and this is kind of, I don't know if this is gimmicky, but I, it came with it. Uh, it has Bluetooth function. Do you think using it like mm. separate or away from the computer, like mm. say on my lap, would help with that? Uh, this is, uh, that's a slippery slope in my opinion, because you might develop unhealthy art habits. You might develop habits of like using it in a very weird angle that can later lead to complications with your wrist, complications with your underarm, uh, carpal tunnel, very fun, arthritis, not very fun. Um, it's usually always better to work at a desk. That is because you can easier, you have an easier time controlling the angles that you're working in. And as well, it, on top of that, if you start drawing on your lap, you might look at your lap and your neck is going to be suffering so much. <laughs> it's bad enough that you do this probably, um, I'm going to assume here, but when I'm on the bus, when I'm on the bus, when I'm on public transportation, I look down too much and my neck hurts eventually because I'm not exercising properly. I'm not taking care of my neck the way that I should be. Uh, so if you do this for hours on end, uh, perhaps looking down, checking, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you want to use the hotkeys on your tablet, right? While you're working on your lab. And so you look at the hotkeys with your eyes and you turn your head a little. That's all so much movement that's not necessary. Usually you want to have a setup where your tablet and your monitor are on the same line of sight. It's a short way. It's a short distance. You don't put extra strain on your neck. You don't put extra strain on your eyes. Um, you don't really want the extra distance that drawing on your, uh, on your lap entails. Same for like being in a weird pretzel position or something. I mean, if it works for you, do it. Probably you're going to have a fun time, whatever. Um, but 
Is it something I recommend? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> can I ask something? Okay. Sure. Uh, you mentioned you made some books earlier. Uh, what are yeah. they? And what are they about? Um, they're not comics. They're I well, I made a comic, but art books mostly. I can talk about this later. Uh, All right. If you if you have time to stick around, but for now, I think I want to continue with the with the workspace. Yeah, sure. So you're a great teacher. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, Phantom Anglos says, is there another opportunity? Oh, uh, is there another opportunity I can join one of your classes? This is a one-time thing. For now, this is going to be the one-time thing, but I am in the talkies. Uh, usually I'm around. You can ask me stuff. So if there's anything pertaining to any of these things, absolutely not a problem. No, you can like... approach me. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. What? All right, I think that might have been a microphone ghost. <clears throat> All right, Nico Plymouth is asking, going to put the question here, but what if we have very little space on our desk for our tablet? Um, that's a very general question. Uh, I don't really know if there's anything you can do about the space on your desk. Uh, that would be my first idea. Um, the reason you're asking that is probably because that's not an opportunity that you can take. Um, so there's not a lot of space on your desk for your tablet. Perhaps you want to find a way to incorporate um, the things you would usually use hotkeys for into your visual working space. So perhaps such a thing as, you know, extracting the history tool and putting it very closely to your working space. You know, that's what I'm doing, basically, because I don't want to be bound to my keyboard to work effectively. Um, so perhaps you can put your keyboard then somewhere else temporarily for the time that you're drawing. This is, of course, a commitment. This could be bad or good. It could be um, bad for you because you might have some things that you want to use hotkeys for, but it could be good because uh, it could keep you from getting sidetracked, chatting with your friends. Maybe that's something worth looking into. Um, other than that, I don't think there's much I can tell you. There's also the hotkeys on your tablet, so feel free to custom map these. Most softwares allow you to do that. Uh, if it doesn't, there is usually third-person software, third-party software, my bad, that lets you do that in other ways. <clears throat> other than that, yeah, I don't really have. Uh, can we change the stabilization in CSP? Does CSP affect the civilization? Uh, if you look here, it's right there. The reason why I'm putting my tool properties here is because you have your stabilizer here, opacity, brush size. Uh, we won't take a closer look at the brush engine because it's quite a lot of uh, optional things we can do with that. But um, if you change something here, or you change something in the actual brush engine, which is here, um, and you want to save this as the new normal for this brush and not just a one-time thing, you click here. If this is toggled, you cannot change any of these things. So if I do that and then I go back here, it's going to be back to 9. Did you see it? I have the locking enabled, and I pull up the stabilizer all the way to... 74. Do you see it? It's very no, It's very small, I know this, but just try and look at the bar. I have this enabled. I go to another tool, and I return, and it's back to 9. This is very, very useful if you have a comfort zone with your tools, but you want to explore something else. So this toggle is what you want to be using for that. This is, by the way, the same thing for, you know, same thing for brush size. It's going to be back to 70. <clears throat> All right, so we have a new beautiful workspace, uh, but you actually want to keep this workspace, you know? When you wake up tomorrow in the morning, you want to start your sigh, uh, sigh, <laughs> look at me, I'm picking up all of guys' names, um, but when you wake up in the morning tomorrow, you want to start your, your clip. And you want to wake up to this. You don't want to wake up to the boxy little layout from before. 
We don't want to be caged in. We want to have this. But clip doesn't actually work that way, which is good. So what do we have to do? Follow me. We got a window, workspace, register workspace. This window will come up. It's going to ask you to assign a name to it. It's probably fine if you just go with whatever it tells you. Workspace 1, Workspace 2 maybe. And then you hit OK. What this does is your workspace is now a file. And if you move or you want to install Clip on another device, you can take this file and you can open your workspace anytime. You never have to do this again. You can do it once and be done with it. And that is beautiful <laughs> because it takes, it, it just saves you so much time, especially if you work modular, especially if you have like several computers or whatever, or if you find that you have to reinstall things often. Absolute lifesaver, huge recommendation. So I'm just changing to some of a workspace. And then I go and change to my main workspace. Yay, it's right there. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Because if not, I would probably move on from the user interface stuff. Um, I have a question. How long have we been going so far? How long has this class been? Uh, this class started at 22, so it's 23.19 for me now, which is, uh, we've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. All right. I was just mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, I didn't mean to talk so much about this, but um, no, no, <laughs> hopefully it's I, been helpful. I learned a lot. <laughs> like, I didn't I'm glad. The class. It's sucking. <laughs> All right. I think I want to take like a little pee break here for a minute, so... Afterwards, we're going to be looking at the actual demo and lasso tool. What we want to be doing is uh, we want to be taking... <clears throat> we want to be using basic shapes. This is going to be the homework sheet. And making these within five minutes. So stick around for that. Break time. Woo! Go get up, take a little walk, drink some water, smell the flowers. Be right back.
um, that's a very large topic. So um, I'm hesitant. Satisfactory. Uh, pertaining to that topic, uh, we can, however, take note of that for like the whole mod team and the sensei team, and take note that there's a lot of interest for the topic. So um, I think that's actually the best idea. Yeah, uh, I'll just take note and then later let the mods know that people are really interested in color theory right now. <clears throat> Other than that, I still invite you to, of course, watch the VOD later because um, we have a VOD. <laughs> Exciting! Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe it's going to help you because, you know, there's a lot of things that you can you can learn even if you don't really... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Break is over! <laughs> What's a VOD? A video on demand. Yay, I know some cool streamer terms. <laughs> Yeah, yummy. <laughs> Funny that the streamer person is the one that doesn't know. All right. So I think we're ready. Let's take a sip before we get up, get back on this. So what do we want to do? <clears throat> sip time. See a call. So what we want to do here is we want to find a way to formulate shapes out of nowhere. Because I find that, <clears throat> in my opinion, in my experience, most of all, the hardest part about starting a painting, the hardest part about starting a drawing, when you don't have an idea. Because there's, you know, there's always the situation that you know what you want to draw, you want to draw this and that warrior person or a magical lady or whatever else. But sometimes you get up in the morning and you're like, <clears throat> I'm going to get on my workstation. I want to turn on my software and I want to warm up. But I don't want to spend an hour sketching, an hour line outing, an hour painting. I want to warm up my sense of shape. I want to warm up my sense of value, my sense of color. <clears throat> How can we do that without having to do the sketch first? Let me show you. By the way, at this point, I want to say, ah, wait, I am an idiot. It's OK. For warm ups, I find it's more pleasing. Like even in general, I find it's more pleasing too work on like a 5 or 10% gray background. Just because of what Space Dad said before, um, eye strain is real. There's no need to work on a white background if it's not part of your composition. So if you just want to warm up, even if it's just shit, like sketches, there's no point to working black on white because you can always remove the gray later. <clears throat> so we have our background. And this is where the magic begins. <laughs> if you've watched me work in a talkie, um, you know how, how it goes. The lasso tool. <laughs> Welcome, y'all. This is my comfort zone here. <laughs> so we have our lasso tool. And now uh, we want to start. We want to be like, so I have like 10 minutes and I want to do some heads. What can you do about that? We go and pick a nice little hue. And then we take something from the mid-range. <laughs> Put her, please. And we take something from the mid-range. Usually this area works well because there's no, you know, it's not too bright. It's not too dark. There's not too much color. It's not a very aggressive tone. We want this kind of mellow feeling. And then we do that. And then we just do a little blob. This doesn't tell you much, right? But what we want to do is we want to carve out a lady from this shape. <clears throat> How do we do that? First of all, we want to keep the tone 
this mellow mid-range tone with a pleasant amount of saturation, but not too much. And we want to just shift the hue. We want to stay in the same range on all other things. So we have our tone. Again, this is our tone. We want to shift it. We want to go in either direction. We don't want to go too far because introducing a complementary um, color might make us be intimidated. <laughs> Adding too much difference to our base color might cause you to be like, ah, wait, that's a shape. And now I have to commit to it, even though you don't, because the magic of this whole routine is that you don't commit to anything until the end. And you are the one who's in control of your decisions up to that point. So we have our shape. And at this point, we want to lock it. There are several ways you can lock your layer. <clears throat> you know that a lot of people like to use a clip layer. Wait, where is it? Here. A layer clip, which keeps your drawings on top of the layer that you've clipped it on, that you've clipped it on. But for this technique, we want to be as destructive as possible. And this is really the only, um, the only context in which you want to do that. But we want to not commit to anything. We want to stay loose. We want to stay free. We want to be beautiful. <laughs> so it's all going to be on one layer to the point where we can't anymore do like but all the way to the point where we really want to come in and we were like, okay, I want to save this. <clears throat> Here comes the lovely chaos says oblivion. And you're right, because this is the part that's going to set you free. <laughs> we go to this version of locking your layer. It's called lock transparent pixel. It's a lock next to the pleasant um, checkerboard pattern that we've come to love. <clears throat> and if you do that, all of the alpha is locked. What is alpha? Very quick. Um, in color, you have actually four X's. Oh no, I'm blowing your mind again. But we have brightness, we have saturation, we have the hue, and we have the alpha. There's no such thing as transparency. There is only such a thing as having 50% alpha, which means it's 50% transparent. In a game engine, when someone disappears into thin air, oftentimes they don't disappear. Their alpha gets turned from 100 to zero, and then they disappear. Because translucency, transparency, that's alpha. So when you lock the alpha of something, we can even do that with something that's not inherently opaque. So right now, this, you can, you can see that uh -uh. this is not opaque. This is transparent. Still, what I can do is I can take the darkest black and I'm drawing over the alpha, but it's keeping its alpha. You see what I mean? Because this area is like, let's say, 20% alpha. <laughs> I'm saying alpha a lot. I might have to like buy someone a drink or however that custom goes. But anyway, um, what we've done is we've locked the alpha. So there's no way to alter it anymore. We can't go more, we can't go less. So <clears throat> that's what's happening here. Back on track. We have our shape. Wait, that's wrong. And our shape is alpha locked now. So there's no way that we can alter. We cannot alter the shape anymore. And we cannot alter the transparency anymore. It either is or isn't. <clears throat> Image processing knowledge paid off, said Beryl. Alpha is key, says Oblivion. Very true. Um, so where do we want to go from here? And I promise this is a technique that if you master it, you can make these heads within three to five minutes, depending on the level of finish. Um, it's going to be a great little exercise to do in the morning to get things going. So we want to go back to our lasso. Again, we've picked our color. Now that it is alpha locked, 
And we want to shift it. And we want to be like, maybe this is a lady that is facing away from us. You know? And then we have our selection, right? And we want to press this button. And because it's alpha locked, it doesn't spill outside of our blob. <laughs> um, okay, we have some people in chat who don't know where the layer lock is, the transparency. Again, it is in your layer corner. It says lock transparent pixel. And it's a little lock with the checkerboard pattern that symbolizes alpha, alpha channel. <clears throat> So we did that, then we did a selection, and then we filled it with the color that we hue shifted. You see? We deselect, and it's already starting to take shape. It's already starting to take shape. It's already starting to make sense. Of course, this is a point where if you showed this to anyone else, they'd be like, OK, <laughs> this is bullshit. Um, I don't see it because it's a very subjective uh, stage in the process. So, <clears throat> all right. So, you guys following? Again, we made the blob. We made it. Uh, we, we switched the transparency. We select it. We filled it. We deselect it. This is our first. Uh, step. What we want to do next is we have decided, okay, this is going to be our hair. <clears throat> but most of the time, especially if you have like uh, a front facing lady, wait, I want to, I want to make a second version of this real quick. And no. Oh, here's a very useful shortcut, by the way. If you hit, no, come, on. there you go. If you hold Control and you double click on the layer, you get what's called a layer selection. A layer selection means that everything that's on that layer is now your selection. So wherever there is something that is not alpha zero, whatever. You could say whatever is existing on that layer is now selected. Why is this useful? I want to fill this layer, but I don't want to do it the basic way, which is to just, you know, we have it already alpha look. So I could just go here, whatever, fill. Okay. Wouldn't have been hard, would not have been very exciting either, though. Instead, what happened is, I wanted to have a selection to then fill that selection because then I know exactly what I am filling before I do it. So I hold control, I double click on the layer, I get my selection and this is where my tool is. And I click it. All right. So, all right, this person, you know, we have a hair color, uh, but I want to make a front facing variant. So, mm, a very good, uh, by the way, a very good part of the face to use for indicating your angle, for indicating your perspective is the ear. Because um, most of you will, pro will probably know this, but when you're looking down and I make a line from your ear to your eyes, the line's going to go down. If you look up and I'm seeing you and I can see like under your chin, your ears are going to be below where your eyes are because they are in very different locations around the head. So at this point in time, what you want to look out for is where's my ear placement? Because we're not putting any facial indicators just now. It's just the hair. And what's almost always showing is the ears. So we're doing this. And we're doing that. Now she's facing to the front. Boom. 
You see this? <clears throat> Here she's facing to the back. Her eyes are here. She's looking down. Here, same lady, but she's turned around by about a quarter of a rotation. She's looking to the front. <clears throat> so in this kind of position, you will find that you are thinking to yourself, but there's more hair to this, you know? We don't just have hair on one side of our face. Maybe you want to do someone with two braids. You know, let's do that for the sake of uh, for the sake of demonstration. Let's pretend this lady has a lot of hair. Maybe she comes from an anime world where people have luscious locks all the time. Um, maybe she comes from a Head and Shoulders commercial. We want to give her two large braids. What you want to do though is. So that at this stage, you can already indicate depth. You want to change the brightness. You want to make it brighter. And you want to desaturate it. Because our focus is here. Our focus is not here. So there's no need to use saturation to guide your eyes to that area. Because that's what saturation does. Our eyes are interested in it. We flock to it like the seagulls. We want to look there. It's the same as with eyes. Saturation, yes, very good. Want to look, very epic, thank you. So we don't want that. We want to go brighter. We want to take out saturation and mimic atmospheric fog almost. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, it's fine. Just know for now, it's mostly going to look better if you take out a little bit of, of both of these boys. Uh, whenever you do something that's in the background. So right now I'm kind of suffering from actually needing a white background because of the colors I chose. My bad. <laughs> uh, so let's put that to the back burner for a second, but this is our pose here. And you can already tell, you know now from a blob, where is the face? Where's the ear? We have hair in the foreground and hair in the background. And this is just three colors. You know? <laughs> Are there any questions up until this point? Ah, okay. Um, Nico Plamov is asking, is this whole technique applicable to things that aren't paintings? I would paint sometimes, but my general medium of interest, I wouldn't much. Um, this technique is applicable to things that aren't paintings because um, you can do this with anything that has a shape, a form, and a color. It just depends on where you want to take it after, you know? Because in the end, we're going to end up with a uh, color, some sketch lines on top to indicate movement, and some very basic refinement. We want to construct a solid base that you can take in any directions from then on. <clears throat> hmm. You can also do this to work out silhouettes, like um, a very good reason to do this regularly is just to practice shape in general, because almost all things in art require a solid understanding of shapes. There's hardly any ways around this. You need it in animation, you need it in design, you need it in CG. Um, so even if it's just for that reason, I really recommend working some kind of working out some kind of te technique that practices these principles. <clears throat> All right, seems it's getting worked out. Actually, I have a quick question. Sure, go for it. Um, so you talk about practicing with shape and stuff, and you know this is of course a method. Do you mm -hmm. think, say, traditional means of practicing with shapes will help you in your digital stuff? Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of variety in that. Um, actually, the other day, I was, I was um, showing this technique to someone else in here, and we had a very interesting discussion about this, because um, what you're essentially doing when you do this is not very different from some techniques techniques to work out uh, the beginning stages of a traditional painting. 
Because in a traditional painting, oftentimes what you will do is you will have a sketch or not. Well, that's optional, but you will have a sketch and then you glaze over it with your base colors. This is basically what if glazing, but no sketching. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because what you're doing is you're only putting down your color shapes, you're putting down your silhouettes, um, and you're trying to forget about the sketch only as to not get lost in the sketch. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I get the idea. So yeah. do, you think, do you think doing, um, say like I go out and I decide to practice some still lifes and I use uh, actual paint and I use those type yeah. of traditional methods, would that, do you think that would help if I were to do this on digital? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I want to say if you have the chance, if you have the opportunity to like take out an iPad and do some plein air sketches, um, do landscapes, break down shapes and landscapes with your digital means, absolutely amazing, stunning. The only, re like, the only reason I would prefer that to doing it traditionally is because I don't want to like buy the colors. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> like I used to have a watercolor phase, so I can really, I see where you're coming from. Um, really the one big boon that you have with this stuff is that you don't have to invest. You don't have to buy anything. You just have your tablet in, in good condition, you know? You want to have a tablet. If you don't have a tablet, you can do this without it. You can do this with markers. You can do this with colored pencils. What this is really about is about starting from another point and letting your eyes witness the world around you in shapes instead of in lines. Because many intermediate artists um, restrict their vision sometimes to seeing uh, geometrical shapes, which is good. You want to, you know, be able to break down a nose into a triangle shape. That's really good if you can do that. But apart from that, you don't want to see the triangle for, you know, the edges in the triangle and like the, you know, the points that connect. You want to see it for the shape and for the volume and for how it's going to change when you put this triangle into practice and make a noise out of it. Do you know what I mean? Hopefully. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I hit something and it like deafened me and then I missed the first. No. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I might have uh, to refer you to the VOD. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> well, can I ask just a simple yes or no? If I were to do like uh, go out, take some actual paint and do something like this with landscape. It would help. Yes. Okay. Yes, always. Cool. You Thank always you. want to go there and break down things like landscapes and you want to see the world outside and you want to observe because your observation skill is the one thing that you cannot practice in your room in the same quality as you can outside. Mm -hmm. All right. Set proof, but it's real. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Answer yes. gained. Don't worry. Gained. Yes. Answer get. Um, but yeah. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Yami wants to say, in my opinion, for sure, in starting out and exploring any medium is to try student grade before artist grade and take advantage of sales at your local shops. Very true. Uh, we have some first work samples by Alessio. Thank you for doing it along. That looks really good so far. I can't wait where it goes. Um, would, it be, would it be good to break down things with the lasso tool and allow opacity, making shapes over the reference instead of drawing over it with lines? If you want to do reference studies with your lasso tool yes but here's a little but that kind of sounds like you want to do that with a face and what you want to do there is basically you want to apply the planes of the face to a face without consulting the actual planes of the face <laughs> i hope this makes sense but there's an easier way to do that than to trace over it with a lower opacity layer in the lasso tool. We already know what the planes of the face are. So if you're interested in that, um, I would recommend having your reference on one side, maybe on the right, maybe like, I want to do something real quick here. I, I would recommend having a setup that is split in three. If you want to do that kind of study. I would say, on this side, you want your reference. <laughs> I mean, of course, these are going to be kind of kind of thin once you divide your monitor, depending on size. So this is just an idea, right? 
listen to this old woman's ramblings for a second here, but you want to have your ref on one side, and then on this side, you want to have the actual artistic, fundamental, academic stuff, you know, the boring theory that is very, very valuable, planes of the face. And in the middle, this is where you're going to combine it. You're going to be like, yeah, I'm going to put this here and I'm going to put that here too and it's going to be beautiful. And that is where you can use your lasso. <laughs> That's where you can go cowboy uh, or cowgirl or co-person. Mm. Because the combination of these two is going to be uniquely yours. And that's the fun of it. You know? <clears throat> so, yeah. Very good idea, Putzer. Maybe this is the way to apply it. Doing it over the other. I think you could do that. But this way, I feel like there's more potential to it. <clears throat> when drawing this way make it harder for you to see the 3D form. So, yes and no. It's about what you want to achieve. And in my opinion, if you want to, if you got to the point where you have a reference and you make a new folder uh, and you make a new layer and the layer on top of the reference is 50% opacity and you're putting in little boxes and shapes with the lasso tool, to trace where the light is and where the darkness is. Do you really see the 3D form? Or are you trying to... Or are you just trying to um, apply a technique to a photo reference? Are you seeing it as the 3D form? Or are you replicating a 3D form onto a 2D picture? Um, and which of these is more valuable? Because in my opinion, understanding comes from constructing it from the ground up but i invite you to explore this on your own because i cannot tell you what works for you i can tell you what i think might work for you but if in the end doing it on top of your reference uh turns out to be a huge boost for your for your like 3d volume understanding of the face I'm not going to stop you <laughs> because I want you to succeed, you know? I want you to find a way to practice that skill and build on it. I just personally would think that seems kind of bad, but what do I know? I am only Yano. <laughs> so, but yeah. Planes of the face, always great to study that. So whichever way works for you, just do it. <laughs> Let's return to our lady and continue. So we have made a blob. We have filled the foreground with foreground hair. Um, we have filled the background with background hair. <clears throat> Hello, sighing person. <laughs> um, so we have this going on. What we want to do next, and you will receive this as the walkthrough. This is the file that you'll get in a second. This is the homework. That's why I'm telling you already. <laughs> um, what we want to do now is we want to start putting down uh, ways of telling what the face is actually doing. Um, I always recommend the first thing you should do is you want to give the eye an angle because this is what's going to tell us the rotation. Because from this, I want to play a little game with you guys here. This face could be looking down. Oops. Oh, no. That's a bad color. Never mind me. This face could be looking down. Or... Come on. Or it could be... It doesn't work out the way I wanted it to. Could be turned towards you. Maybe even more. I just, with this particular person, I'm not seeing many options, but um, with some of these, 
this one, you can pretty much have it be angled either way. If you only have the ear, you can have it look up, you can have it look down, you can have it look straight on. Yeah, this maybe wasn't the best example to show that particular effect, but anyway, ear, very important. You will find that sometimes artists have a very beautiful face and a very beautiful ear, but because of the combination of the two, something seems off about it. And that's because the rotation of the ear is a very, very peculiar thing that it's very valuable, uh, always making sure that it's on the same perspective as your face. Because the head is round. <laughs> and it, do not, it does not like not being round. And it's always going to be noticed. Um, wouldn't, draw, wouldn't drawing this way make it harder for you to see through? Oh, no, wait. I'm reading old messages. Never mind. Homework. Yeah, no playing it safe. Regarding it, teaching, only talking about first hand information, talking about what she knows. Well, yeah, Coder, because um, there's a lot of information out there. So I'd like it to be things that I can actually vouch for. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, this doesn't really have to be proper homework, though. Just warm it up. Just warm up with it every day, says Autumn. Very true. I cannot wait to see what you guys do with this. Um, so let's hurry and finish the demo. So I think I'm going to go with the looking down variant just because it's more visually interesting to me right now. Uh, we can have the face mimic this curve. Do you see what I mean? So that's why I would like to pursue this one. <clears throat> let's carve out the nose a little more just to get a sense of what's going on. This doesn't have to be much. You don't have to do this at all. Oh, someone's echoing. Can we do something about that? Test. Hmm. Oh, well. I'm just going to try speaking a little quieter. Nope, still happening. Can we do something about this? Yeah, it's retro. Hey, Retro Cemetery, can you do something about... Thank you for muting. Um, I invite you to no check problem. out your settings later. Thank you. So, okay, let's go back to this. So we've carved out the nose a little bit just to make it more clear. Um, <clears throat> what we want to do next is we want to put the nostrils. This is another very valuable and very dangerous tool because the nostrils have a very peculiar rotation towards the nose and towards um, where they attach to the cheek. Attach to the cheek perhaps isn't the most precise way of putting it, but I'm pretty sure you guys know what I mean with this. So uh, with the looking down pose, you don't really have this kind of shape. Oh, it kind of looked like Val Valuigi there for a second, like, hello. Oh, hello, Valuigi. Oh, never mind me. <clears throat> but you don't really get too much of this section because when you look down, uh, the nostril starts to disappear <clears throat> underneath the wing of your nose. <laughs> I like that the whole chat is starting to say, well, thank you guys. <laughs> uh, either way. So we don't really have this going on. Um, instead, you want to you want to keep play it safe. You want to keep it simple. Maybe just a little curvature, uh, you know, suspension of disbelief or whatever. Um, it's all right to play aesthetics over anatomy at this point because we're trying to warm up. We don't want to warm up exclusively our anatomy. We want to warm up our shape of function, uh, our sense of function, our sense of shape, our sense of harmony as well. So this is perfectly all right. <clears throat> so we have this I like to put a little indentation here um, just to have fun with it as a treat we can, in, we can uh, start to carve out a little shape for the chin or another region of the face that helps you personally to lock down a perspective don't do too much. 
Because this would be the phase where people start getting tempted to start rendering, to start putting down gradients, be like, I want to draw the eye, I want to draw this, I want to draw that. But what you want to do is you still want to talk in shapes. These lines are to help you. Um, basically, it's a post-it note to future you. It's a way to tell yourself, by the way, we want to do this perspective, right? So don't fuck it up for me, dear future me. <laughs> Um, what you can do as well is to just go in, right click the color that you're working with, that you want to expand. Because right click and clip, and click, and click. <laughs> right click is color pick. So now we have this color. And then we can go in here, fill, done. We have carved out the shape, we have made it more concrete. <clears throat> So Valuigi, as you can tell, we are now here. We are indicating facial features and we're almost done. This is where we want to go. And we're almost there because what we are doing is we're building a foundation. And the stronger your foundation is, the better the result. This is always the case. No matter how much of a render you want to do, um, the foundation is the part where you need to be working with your brain, not just with your hand. Alessia, that looks really good. Please continue sharing. I really like this. <laughs> so what we want to do now is we want to put our values. This is all like, if you take your color picker, do you see it? Because we were being so careful in the beginning, all of this is the same value. We can check this very easily. We can go to tonal correction, gradient map, and look at the grayscale. And there's almost no contrast. You know? So, hello, Colprod. We're talking about um, constructing character portraits from a shape basically exercises to you know exercise your sense of color your sense of shape your sense of personality from you know it's a very good warming up uh, thing to do you can expand this into any direction you want <clears throat> there will be homework to do this and practice this on your own later and you will get feedback on it so yeah sweet feedback and homework <laughs> anyway we have this and it's almost all a soup of value, which is great because this is the part where we take that soup and we pull some of the detail towards us. We carve out detail, we add value to add saturation, add brightness, make it pop. And we push other things to the background, we make it darker, we take away saturation, we put it to the background. This is the part where the magic happens. <laughs> So what we want to do is we want to be like, okay, sure. Um, our light sauce is going to be here. So we know that hair works in strands and clumps. So we select some strands and clumps. We want to keep it general. We don't want to go too much into the details here. We want to select strands and clumps. We want to select another strand here. This is another strand. You can see that. I'm choosing very generously strands of hair, right? The light catches here because her hair follows this shape. So we say like the number strand there. As well, here on the background here, we want to select a chunk. This would be the chunk. And then a strand to bring back the shape. A really cool idea for hair. <clears throat> is to remember that there's going to be stray hair. How can we indicate stray hair that's not part of our current values, that's not part of the current part that we're working on? We can just select the negative space for it. So instead of selecting, instead of selecting this hair, oops, you know, instead of selecting this hair, the part, you know, where the hair split off of the uh, value group that it's part of. 
and then he reunites with it. <clears throat> so we have our selection. By the way, don't be afraid to sometimes hit this button to invert your selection and then maybe take away some. But don't do this too much because right now we still, we want to be general and we want to keep it general. And then we go, tonal correction, here saturation, brightness, and we pull this up and we pull this up and we shift the hue, done. You know? <clears throat> I'm gonna look at chat. All right. You're all good retro, don't worry about it. Mm. Arts and Goodies asks, for these lasso selections, do you ever use the selection brush? No, I don't. Why do I not do that? Because we want to avoid brush work. We want to think in shapes. And if you allow yourself to use the selection brush, you will most likely fall back into the patterns that you work in when you use a brush, which is the opposite of what we want to do. You can, of course, incorporate the selection brush into your workflow if you feel that it aids you because again these are techniques to help you um get to the next stage you know so if the selection merge is something that helps you get there sure why not <laughs> who am i to keep it from you but if it was up to me i would say please don't use the selection brush use the lasso because you have less control over it and that's the point it's restriction by design. <clears throat> Is there a way to watch what's happening on my phone? I've never been in a classroom on my phone. You can watch the Twitch stream, courtesy of Yami. Uh, people are pressing it in chat, so... <clears throat> oh, I see. Everyone's already telling them. Thank you, guys. How the um, fuck? Amazing transformation. Thank you. <laughs> may I ask how you choose... So you show me again how you choose the color for... Um, yes. For the change in the hair. Thank you. Yes, let's do it. Um, so again, we have our selection and what I want to do is I want to think, okay, we have, we have our middle value. It's not very bright. It's not very dark. It's not very saturated. This is by choice because <clears throat> again, by the way, I'm going to kill these layers real quick because I see someone in chat who's talking like, oh, separate layers for this and that. No, this is one layer. You want it to be one layer because of many reasons. Anyway, so again, we have our selection here. How do we use this selection that we have to carve out the effect of light hitting something? First, you have to understand that a quick part of color theory that is very important in this area is saturation happens because of light. There is no inherent color in the world. Color only happens because light hits the color and lets the color be a color because light is reflected off of it. What does this mean for you as an artist? It means your shadows are usually less saturated than your midtones and your highlights. And your highlights are usually more, high, more saturated than your midtones and your darks. So when you have this situation where you have an area and you're like, this is where my light hits, the first thing you want to do, your instinct is, it's brighter. So I put up the brightness. Right, but it's also the area where the light hits, and light hitting something means that light is reflected of something, which means saturation exists. So you want to, at the same time, move up your saturation. Um, Oblivion is asking in chat, can I use play uh, PlayStation? <laughs> My bad. Photoshop to do this. Yes, you can use any software to do this. You can use fucking paint.net to do this. You can use GIMP, anything, Krita, whatever. This is universal. <clears throat> so, again, 
Saturation and brightness always come in pairs. This is a rule that you can break once you know how to break the rules. For now, I recommend personally move them together because they belong together. Let them dance. But you will notice that this is still different from the color I had in a second because apart from just shifting brightness and saturation, color theory tells us that every light source usually has an innate color. What does this mean for you as an artist? <clears throat> It means that you have to do the tiniest bit of design, even when you do a head. Because where are we? Are we outside? If yes, make it a bit more yellow. Are we in the night? Maybe have it blue then. But light, night means less light, means less saturation. You know? This is the part where you decide on the mood, you know? This is the part where you decide what is the surroundings of our character without showing us directly. So what you want to do is you always want to be hue shifting because having a light source that tells us nothing is, makes for an uninteresting drawing, even if it's just a five-minute head. So again, we want to be shifting saturation, brightness, Make them more intense at the same time because they move together. They're in a pair. They belong together. Um, and then you want to shift the hue to give an interesting color dynamic to your surroundings. Hey, Sana, can you mute? Thank you. <clears throat> color palette is really cool. Very good. Oh, yeah, yummy. That looks really sweet. Um, Spudzer asks, asks, how did you shift the hue? Very, very easy. Uh, tonal correction, hue saturation, brightness. This shader is universal in every art software that you know. It's always the same. Um, so you want to do put this up, put this up, shift this. Thank you, yummy. So. Thank you now very we much have, for this explanation. Thank you very much. Don't worry about it. Um, so now we have a lighting, you know, a lighting setup. What else do we need to make this look coherent? Well, we have, we have no secondary facial features. We have no clothing. But we also don't really have um, shadows. A very, very easy way to make your shadows look coherent is to learn about what is ambient occlusion. <clears throat> That's a big and scary word for a second there, but trust me, um, it's okay. <laughs> you will have a good time once you know what ambient occlusion is because ambient occlusion is um, basically a shadow map on, for example, a 3D object that tells you where does the light just never get to, you know? Is there an area on this character or on, on this object where there's no need to have any light there ever? A good example is, imagine you're drawing a character. Imagine this is a dude who's wearing a white t-shirt. Is there a reason for you to put light into his sleeve? In a very, very generic lighting setup, usually the answer is no. So when I'm drawing a character like her, like this blonde lady here, when I look at her, I'm thinking like, she has a lot of hair. So there's not a lot of light that gets from here to there. Um, there's not a lot of light that like gets here just because her hair kind of blocks this off already, you know? So I can probably imagine that this area and like under her jaw, there does, there's probably not a lot of light there. Um, so what we can do as we enter the refining stage, which is going to be what's happening now, because we, add to, we get to add things like the eyes, uh, we get to add the lips, and we get to add character-defining features that is basically just going to, going to be like flexing your muscles for character design. 
uh, more shapes, more colors. This is where you get to go wild because you've, you, these are all steps that require you to do a lot of thinking, you know? And now's the fun part because you get to just fucking go crazy. Ah, go stupid. Ah. Um, but before we do that, let's put this last steps that require you to, like, you know, actually be thinking. <laughs> so let's pick up the current darkness color that we have which is the lighting color here, and use that with the gradient tool, which is this tool. And we want to use foreground to transparent. What this does is it's going to be a transition from the color that you have currently chosen and 100 alpha, which we now know is 100 opaque. It's not see-through, it's not transparent. And it's a perfect transition in a gradient from that to your color, but with zero alpha, which we now know is completely transparent. There's no single opaque pixel left. And when we use this tool and you click the ground, you will get this um, line. <laughs> this line is the length of your gradient. Do you get what I mean? So if I let go now, on the left side, here, that's where it's going to start. So this is where it's going to be my color and not transparent at all. And where I let go, it's going to be where it's completely transparent, nothing left. And what this means is, you can tell, I get a gradient. Perhaps this is information you already knew, but um, gradient tool, lasso, they are siblings. <laughs> they get along very, very well. Let me tell you that. <clears throat> so we want to go to all the areas where we, were, we can safely assume there's not going to be a lot of light. I want to go here. By the way, I'm using black for demonstrational purposes, but here's some quick knowledge on color theory. Even though this isn't even real black, you don't really want these extreme... Uh, you don't really want these extreme contrasts here. This is a lot. You see that? That's a lot. <laughs> I know that we picked this color from here, right? Jesus, there's a lot of people here. Wow. Hello. Yeah. Welcome. Please join us. Oh, uh, we're actually about to wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, I have an idea what might be happening. Yeah, I, okay, see, this is what happened. Um, I wasn't paying attention because I was talking to you guys and we were using the wrong color slot. So I guess watch out for that. <laughs> we want to do that again. Pick the color, remove these. And once again, think about where does the light not reach ever? This is called ambient occlusion. I'm going to show you guys some pictures in a second to further show what I mean. You're using this to further push away some parts of your painting because you want to push and you want to pull. This is a very good example. You know, it's the areas where light is very, very unlikely to regularly hit because light is just one single ray that bounces off and off and off and off a whole bunch of times. And you got to think all of these rays of lights, where do they not land so often? 
you know? So, M in declusion, that's what you want to do. Um, it can aid to have a very, very clean look if you allow yourself to sometimes not use the gradient tool, but instead directly move in. See, I can tell that um, because I have a bright line here. Bright lines and very dark lines usually look best when they're very, very close to another. That's how we define a very sharp edge. And we want edge control and we want to be in control. You know, you don't want to put, place these randomly. <clears throat> so you can see I'm kind of putting down some some lines. And now that I'm starting to carve out my values, because that's what I'm doing, I'm starting to add darks. I'm starting to add small darks, precise darks, before I later go and move on and add the more extreme ones. And this is the part where I start to zoom out. Do you know why I do that? <clears throat> Anyone? Uh, could I answer the question? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, let's postpone the question then for a second, because I want to say the reason I'm zooming out. But, but, uh, but uh, about the reason, is it because you need to have a better vision of your job from far away? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's as close as, that we, as we might get. Um, oh. So I want to start now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Star given. Star given. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to be reminded of our shapes. Because now that we were starting to put small shapes, we need to be reminded of the large shapes. Because all the small shapes we want to put, we want them to be only a way to bring accentuation to our large shapes. Because that's they are what we are doing this for, you know? We need to be careful that we don't have this. You remember when in the beginning I was talking about value start value paintings and I was talking about the grace on the side? We don't want to get lost in the small shapes and then ruin all of our large shapes. That's what we want. And that's why you want to zoom out and be like, oh, right. Why am I doing this? Um, I should be focusing on this. You know? Because this is already a large shape. And if I don't want to, if I think that filling it goes too hard, I do a gradient to accentuate this shape that I can clearly see. Because I have an S curve I can carve out here. And you always want to be carving out S curves, you guys. S curves, they do be tasty. Um, but yeah, coder, I think it was. Oh no, you kind of already uh, were uh, answering the question, right? Uh, in terms mm. of why you want to add darker values. Ah, uh, okay. Zoom out, sorry. Yeah, it's because this is the part where we can recognize our drawing, where we can recognize the shapes for what they are. There is a few things that are desirable, and there are a few things that are not desirable. The things that are desirable are, for example, an S curve. And we kind of gave ourselves a setup here where we can follow this S curve, you know? Um, another way, by the way, to reset your eyes a little is to flip, but the part, you know, there, there, there can be a point in your progress where you, where you flip so much that it also gets, um, you know, subjectified, where we, where we cannot flip to get a fresh eye because we've already seen the flip version so many times as well that it's harder, um, that it's getting hard to see your errors, your arrows, errors, my bad. <laughs> it's going to have to see your errors, errors in the flip version as well. I mean, you get it. I'm not going to say that word again. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so we zoomed out and we realized oh, we can make an S curve happen. So we want to trace this shape. And we want to give it that pizzazz that it so desperately wants to have. 
Hell yeah. And now this shape. I mean, now we've taken away from, <clears throat> from our lighting setup. Is this a reason to panic? No. Is this a reason to be concerned? Perhaps. Um, what does this mean for this particular drawing? It means that now, because of the change in composition, it looks like she has green hair and a yellow headdress. Is this a problem? No, because we have remembered that this is already our highlight color. You know? What do we do to take away from our highlight color? We know that we have to take away brightness, but we also have to take away saturation because we are smart. <laughs> so now the headdress has a shade color. You know? All right, I want to look into the chat. Big brain. Oh, that looks really nice. Ramen, that's very beautiful. Coder, I really like that base shape. Oh, sweet. Pelushi. I hope that's pronounced correctly. Please don't mind me. <laughs> I really like this. You guys are getting the hang of it. Very nice. Rowdy Critic, yes. Nico, very sweet. Marmor, too. I really like this. Alessio, amazing. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to see what you do with the homework. <laughs> I cannot wait. Ooh. Cinnamon, Marmor again, paper, Goblin, yeah. Those are all looking really good. Um, one mistake I'm seeing is some of you guys are going too far into the details already and you didn't uh, put down enough uh, large shapes before you went into the smalls. But I have to say, for some of these, it kind of works, you know? <laughs> for some of these, it kind of looks like a stylistic choice and I kind of dig that. Um, but yeah. Absolutely sweet. I love it. Um, Alessio, absolutely not a problem. Um, I am in the talkies a lot. You can approach me in a talkie if you have questions on any of these things. Um, so it's absolutely not a reason to be upset. There's no such thing as far behind. There's only later. Thank you. And much. later can be fixed. <laughs> no worries. So. We have our shape here. And then what I want to do now is you will find on the homework sheet. Um, I'm telling you how to define your highlight. I'm telling you how to define your midtone. This is your midtone. This is your highlight. But they come organic. You can already tell from the people who posted in chat. You can clearly tell because of the way that you set these up. What is your dark? What is your midtone? What's your highlight? And you can build off of these. So there's no need to be stressing about all these fancy words. <clears throat> so once you have these colors done, you can then go in and be like, ah, well, the whole headdress situation is kind of not a very good idea. So I want to go back to before we made it a headdress. <clears throat> that was a tangent anyway. So we have big hair. We have our brights. We have our ducks. This is our dark now. We want to introduce some darks. I'm going to do this liberally. <clears throat> I'm just thinking about where does my hair, where does my light go? Where does it not go? I'm not thinking too much about making sense. So I'm trying to make the braid work real quick. Just, you know, putting in the lights, reinforcing the shape. 
I am not afraid to delete some of the lines I've already put down because again, we want to be in control of this technique. We want to be the one making the decisions. We do not want to be afraid to delete something just because we think we cannot do it better because it, we can do it better. You always can. And if you find that hair number two, or hair number three looks worse than hair number one, just wait for hair number 10. It's going to be crazy. <clears throat> Yes, Oblivion. That's actually the one I'm going to post at the end. There's a, a secret homework, which comes along with that. So don't worry about it. You will get it at the end, uh, which should be pretty soon. Don't worry about it. No, this doesn't work. Be gone. I want to introduce you to another technique that I like to use, um, which is... When you hold hair against the light. <laughs> Honey, you've got a big stop coming. Again. When you hold hair against the light, you usually don't see this. Oh, I am silly. You usually don't see this. Instead... You will see this. And this has gaps. Do you see this? That is because not all sides of the hair catch light equally. When you have hair that is in a situation where one side of the hair is being lit, you will also have parts of the hair that are not lit. I know, crazy. But follow me here. What does this mean for you? It means that this looks like hair because of these empty spaces. Why is that? Because the hair is turning. Because the hair is doing this. And this is the part where it flips. And that's the part that does not catch light. So, what does this mean for you as a painter? For you as an artist? It means that... And again, we want to stay on one layer as to not be afraid. <clears throat> when we select these kinds of strands and we put them down, we don't fill this up, you know? We leave it like this. Instead, you could even reinforce this effect. Do you see this? It's not connected, but that doesn't matter because when we zoom out, we're like, that's hair, all right? Yeah. Captain Flamingo said, so it's basically the whole hair is like ribbons thing. Yeah, you're right. Hair is exactly like ribbons. Especially if you think about hair in lighting conditions. It usually always looks better if you follow these kinds of rules. It grounds the hair. It makes it more atmospheric. There's a whole lot of rules that you can, of course, apply to this kind of thing. So do not generalize. But this... This is fly. <laughs> so. You want to go like this. And then just kind of go crazy. It looks much better. Um... This whole effect, of course, uh, it really lifts off of contrast. So the current situation, um, it's not really doing it for me. What we can do about that is we can take this hair with the weird color palette that we have right now and start the process that follows me for my entire workflow from start to finish. Tone curve. 
What is the tone curve? This is an interface. Mm, here. This is an interface that basically has two roles in what it does. These are your values. You give if and you take if away. <laughs> this is your darks. I mean, no, 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 wait, this is your brights. This side, this is the brights. So if I remove all brights, it's all dark. This is your darks. If I make all darks very, if I like add to my darks, it becomes very bright. You see this? These are our extremes. So these are all of the midtones that we have. And this line represents the way that we can shift all this. What does this mean for you as an artist? It means that these here, do you see these black lines? That's where my values are. So if I want to change my values, I want to change the graph where my values are indicated in the graph. Do you get it? This is all the bright highlight that I have right now. All of this and all of that. So if I do this, do you see it? You know? The tone curve is your way of taking a drawing that you made where all of the shapes and all of the nice little lines that you put, you like them, but you don't know what to do with it because you're just, ah, oh, this is like fucking, this is green, this is yellow, there's a whole lot of red, those contrasts aren't speaking to me. I don't know what to do with this. I'm not seeing anything in it. I don't see a character in this. I see woman hair. I don't see a coherent palette. Allow yourself room to breathe. Go into the tone curve. Go into one of the channels and just push some shit around. Because essentially, what do you want to learn? You want to learn how to push shit around until you see something that gives you an idea. You don't want to be waiting for inspiration at your desk. You want to be looking for inspiration with a shovel in a gold mine. And the taunt curve is that gold mine. Because you will be surprised the amount of weird combinations that you will find that make you think, oh my God, this is obviously, I don't know, this could be a night elf. Sounds stupid, but this is how this goes. Like right now, when I look at this, I'm thinking like, oh, she's really colorful. It's like almost pastel the way that this is green and this is blue now. I like that contrast. Oh my God, if I had like some pink, she could be like some bubblegum person. I could give her like a balloon or she could have like candy accessoire, you know? And that's how the... <laughs> Yana, why are you making everyone Twitter artists? The fuck is a Twitter artist? Get out of here, Stevie. <laughs> Um, excuse me man this stuff is complicated it's not complicated all you did up to this point was blob add blob on blob uh, indicate face draw in facial feature focus which is the nose and then you did a bunch of ribbon hair and then you colored that in and then you add the rest and this is not a draw the rest of the fucking horse. This is not a draw the rest of the owl. This is really just... I want to drive this home, so I'm going to do it again. Because I told you in the beginning, you can do this in three to five minutes. And the head is done. You have hair. This is the shape. And then you have hair. Let's say... This. And we indicate the ear. And we lock the transparency, we put down our color, and we do this. We give, her, we give ourselves a second hair thing, we hue shift, we make it brighter, but we lose some saturation. So, we have this much already. 
And that took, what, 10 seconds? You can do a million of these in a minute. Well, maybe not a million, but... <laughs> so we know now that we want to indicate the rotation of the head. So we do some flesh-colored little things to indicate this is where the top of the nose sits. We want to do the top, not the bottom, because the bottom is a shadow, and we have learned before, shadows are less saturated. We want to work with saturated middle ground colors. The tip of the nose is always exposed to sunlight. It's very flush. There's a lot of circulation going on. Blood vessels, this and that. So we want to indicate the ear curvature and the tip, the top of the nose. So now we have all this already. We want to indicate some more facial features. So we pick a dark color. We make it small. We indicate the nose. I want to add my line for the, for the ear to show the uh, curvature of the outer shell. And now I want to add our values. So I know that I have my light source is again behind her. This is actually for simplicity side sake because sometimes when you do a light source that's in front, uh, it gets a little finicky with things like the eyes and stuff. So. We want to do behind. Uh, secondary lighting is much easier, and much softer. So we know that brightness and saturation always go together. And we want a huge shift to give our lighting personality. So we have this much already. Now we want to use this and actually put some per uh, personality in the hair. We want to have some more shading, some more lighting. We want to start using the gradient tool. to indicate flow of light. Already, it's looking like a person that's standing under a bright source of light. Now we want to start using the ribbons. Maybe she's like an insect person, you know? She has like two little, oops, I didn't mean to do that. She's like two little thingies. So we can then use that as an actual character design thing. So at this point, I told you we want to do some ambient occlusion. Areas where there's just no light. This time we have a collarbone showing. Maybe here as well. So we pick our darkest color, we desaturate it. I think I want it to be more blue because we have such a cold color scheme here. And I'm not used looking at the chat right now because I want to do this demo to really show you guys that I'm not, I'm not shit talking when I say that this is something that's meant to be quick. This is something that's meant to generate something very, very rapidly to give you several things that you can warm up at once. So we have basically all that matters, um, except for, you know, more contrast. So I want to do a duplication of this. And I want to add in the eyes. Maybe they're looking to the side. And then give just a rough indication of where I want the eyeballs to be. Don't be afraid to go a little harder than you need to be. Again, you want to learn how to be unafraid of ruining things that you've done so that you can draw over them again and again and eventually develop the confidence to make destructive moves without having them destructive because you can replicate them. Of course, this depends largely on workflow, but uh, for the sake of this demo, I'm going to do my usual safety measures and just go go ham, as the youth says. Um, so now we have eyes. And then we can go in, uh, be like, okay, we have like a greenish hair color. I want to color pick this. I want to choose a darker color. If you shift it a little, just a little, and then use that to construct eyebrows for our friend. I like to use the gradient tool 
as a base because now I can use concrete shapes with a brush which again we don't want to use the brush at all if possible the brush is a crutch with this technique kind of harsh but it's okay in this case I want to do it to show why I usually like to use a gradient for the eyebrows usually with this technique you will find that um, either I don't do the eyebrows or the eyebrow lines are an afterthought. This one has no further eyebrow definition. You can see here that I'm using some lines on top, <clears throat> but I want to avoid it. So again, we have our character here. Put the eyebrows back to the back. Go ham. So this character is kind of dumb. Um, what he needs is some more darks. So I want to duplicate this again. I want to go tonal correction. Hue saturation. If I find that this character needs a darkness pass. Um, I mean, I almost made a mistake there. <laughs> uh, but I want to hue shift it towards a more red toned direction because we're losing a lot. Of, we're, we're using a lot of blues. We're using a lot of cold colors here. Um, <clears throat> now we want to take away from this. We want to do that with a mask. We don't want to be destructive with this face. If you do a darkness path, you want to go layer mask. You want to, first of all, you want your dark colors to be a duplication that you then layer shifted. So you took huge saturation, you moved it on a separate layer. And then you want to go layer mask. Uh, wait, that's wrong. You want to go layer mask, mask selection. Now you have a mask. I hope you paid attention when Ethan talked about masks, but I'm going to do this again with you guys. I'm going to give you, <laughs> I'm going to take your little baby hand and um, <laughs> so. What we have here is this white sheet. This white sheet is your mask. So now when you draw, when you erase, when you erase from your layer mask, that hides the layer, but you're not destroying the layer with the dark color. You are taking away the ability of the dark color to be seen. It's still there, but it's hidden by your mask. When you do a shadows pass to give more value difference and more contrast to one of these heads, you want to do a mask so you don't destroy your colors and you can do stupid shit. Because again, we want to be the one in control. We want to be the stupid shit bender. And we want to be able to use a fucking airbrush and just do this and do that. And this is the only time I'm letting you use a fucking airbrush. I'm telling you guys, if I catch you with an airbrush and a talkie, there's going to be consequences. Consequences. Because now we didn't erase our dark color. We worked with a mask. We can just do this. We can just put it back in. And that's why you want to do that. Because now you can be like, oh, I don't have consequences. I apologize for the curse word. You have not heard that. Ooh. Um, you can just put these back in wherever you want them. Because our light source is here. I want the ear to have some. I want this to have some. I want to be able to use laser to shave out the shape of the um, of the nose, and I can do this. You know? Are you following me? Is there any questions to this point? <laughs> it's not a question, but I want to say, I will come to your house, and I will delete the airbrush on your on your software <laughs> if you don't use it well, because it's a dangerous tool. You are not ready to weld it, to wield it. 
I actually have a quick question. Sure, do it. Um, what do you think of doing these like in fast succession? Do you think that actually helps or is it? Yes. Like, that, okay. That's actually the homework. <laughs> so spoiler, because what you want to do is you want to have, you want to force your brain to look at a shape that makes no sense. And you want to be able to put something in there. Some people like to do an exercise where they have these blobby shapes and they put like a body in there or like design a creature out of that. What we want to use this technique for is to make these shape and character studies in quick succession, you know? So I think I'm ready to segue out of this and towards the homework. But before that, I'm seeing some, some uh, stuff in chat. So I want to talk about that real quick. For the shadow layer, could we change it from like normal to something else like multiply or hard light? You could, but remember, what's the point? I mean, this has more contrast, but you didn't make it yourself. There's no, um, generally, absolutely, I do not have any qualms with any layer blending modes. They're amazing. You have to understand what they do bef because that way you're actually using them from a point of logic and not from a point of experimentation. I don't know what all of them do. I'm telling you, I will be honest. But for this exercise, we want to know what we're doing and we want to have done it ourselves. So I don't want you to use them. I want you to have to copy your layer and shift it around and then find a way to blend them. If you feel that you need a shadow pass, because again, you don't normally need a shadow pass with this technique. A shadow pass is something you can do if you feel that your composition is too light and you want that, you know? For all of these, oops. For all of these, I did not do a shadow pass. I lassoed an area and you can tell, you know? You can tell that I didn't use a shadow pass. Because my values are still kind of close, but they're very, very clear in where they are sharply contrasted, you know? So, <clears throat> if you want to do a shadow pass, I implore you, do it in normal mode. Um, Captain Flamingo asks, so are you doing this whole masking because you felt like a like, contrast or what? That's exactly it. Uh, you are right. I did this because I realized... I started with a color that was too far here instead of further down. So I'm learning, but the next time I'm not going to do that again because I'm teaching myself by means of having to correct my mistake that this is what had to be done, you know? <clears throat> I actually have another question. Yes, um, do it. So about the, you well, you start off with the big blob shape, and then, of course, from there, you try and find a face, and that's the whole thing. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you say about cutting into that blob? Are you supposed to just keep it as is, or can we, like, change um, the original shape? I like, I like to do that in the end phase. Um, you will now, like, at this point, you would see me realizing that um, I don't need to retain some of this information. I could do much better if I used my technique of, using, uh, ah, that's not what I want. You would see me, now that it's back to one, because I merged my shadow pass into my original composition, you will see me taken away from things like this, because I, I read this as hair, and I want it to be read as hair. So I'm following the fall of the hair and carving out a negative space shape to further accentuate the nature of the hair, you know? And I don't restrict myself, but do this in the final phase. When we look at the spreadsheet, then you're going to spreadsheet. Well, it's not really a spreadsheet, but when you look at the homework sheet, you will see that I do that a lot, but I only do it after the base is done, you know? After the base is done, you can do whatever the Heck you want. But before that, you are not taken away and you're not adding on because if you do it before that, you're doing it because you cannot cope with your base. And that's a crutch. 
anything after and you're using it because you already know what you want to do and you're ready to go further with it. And that's the difference. And that's why I don't want you to do that until you get to that point. You know? Yeah, I get it. Thank you. Nice. Welcome. So <clears throat> I am very happy to see all of you guys um, participating and trying to do it at the same time. Very cool. I like it a lot. So now we have this whole situation. Yay. And at this point, that's where you would be like, okay, I can clearly tell the nose is broken, but uh, do we want to go in and actually fix that? Can. But does it serve the purpose of the exercise? Do we want to make one pretty painting or do I want to make 10 or five um, in quick succession and think more about shapes? You can go both ways. One of these days, you know, you can choose to do this exercise in the morning to wake up and then you're like, I actually like this. I want to fix it and take it further. This could be like your daily Instagram post to, you know, beat the algorithm. Very cool. But you could also be like, I want to do character design. I want to practice that. And at that time, I would rather say, please go in there, um, take your time, spend one to five minutes on one of these, abandon it, go to the next. Get them out there one after the other because that is the design aspect. And that's what you want to be practicing at that point in time if that is what you're interested in. Again, it depends. Are you an animator? Are you a designer? Or are you an illustrator? <clears throat> For an animator, those exercises can be very fun because um, there's some changes you can make to this workflow that will help you if you're trying to become a designer for animation. Because a designer for animation, if they see me doing the thing where I like take out little cute shapes and stuff, they would kill me. Because that's not how animation works. Animation works based on shapes and you don't cut away, you don't add anything, you decide on a shape and you stick with it. <laughs> There's some YouTube videos that talk about this. Um, I'm pretty sure the designers among us, uh, I mean, the animation people among us, they probably know these better than I do. But again, think about your level of detail. Think about how much time you want to spend on these. Think about where you want to go with these. There's a lot of ways to customize this workflow to do work for you the way you need it. And that's the goal of this exercise. And I'm happy you guys were here with me. Let's start doing Q&A. Or what do you guys think? Oh, these are looking really cool. Hey, hey. Oh, Oblivion, that's really cute. Alessio, that's really nice. I really like the contrasts in yours. Some of you guys are going really abstract, and I love that. Coder, you're doing great. Diffkrantz. Paper cuts. Oh, they're so cute. You even put a little hand in there. Marmo, bless you, dude. I did, hope. Did I this class just start? Nope. No, I just I'm I'm done with the demo and the clip studio part. God damn it! It's Q and A time. Hello, Millie. Thanks for joining. And my car broke down and I was stranded. I, I, I just oh, got back. Oh, oh no! Oh. I have What's a up, question. Stevie? Yes. Why are you making everyone tweeter artist? How is that tweeter <laughs> artist? <laughs> it's Explain. it's just it's it's kind of a it's kind of a popular style. I'm I'm joking by the way. <laughs> nah. You I are have, uh, weak. Technical technical question. Can you yes. tell me again how how you use the uh, gradient tool with the lasso because yes. I, when I use it it deselects the lasso every time so it's quite annoying. Yes. Um very simply, you want to have a color, and you're like, okay, perhaps I want to have him have his eyes a little more sunken for this specific purpose right now. Yeah. And then you go to gradient, foreground to transparent. That's the one you want. 
I'm not sure. I mean, from the point of view of clicking around, so really the so you click on the and you select the gradient ah, from the tools. Okay. Yes. You no want to have your selection already, so it has the dancing little line. That's when you know you're ready. You know. Mm -hmm. And, and then you do because, I, because I'm doing it on the on the iPad, so the, I have oh, the okay. gradient tool on the on the bar, which opens when you use the lasso. The problem is that after after I use the gradient tool, the lasso deselects automatically, mm. and so I have to rego opening a menu, which because on the iPad you want to have everything closed, so I don't. Yeah, have those, uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. I'm going to talk about yeah. specifically clip stuff. I want to thank everyone oh. for being here. Uh, because we're ending the recording of the stream. Thank you. Whoa, Ramen.